It's a great pleasure for me to be here today, uh, trying to sharing part of my job, part of my experience, part of you know this amazing job, which is communication. Um, this center is a premium center for scientific research, and you all are giving us a better future. So first of all, I want to thank you, every one of you, for, for what you're doing daily because it's important. Science is important and it's important to communicate science properly and to communicate with all scientific values. Uh, a special thanks to Suzanne, really. Thank you very much. And to Director General and to everyone on, uh, who are following this seminar. So, uh, okay, this is me. <laughs> it's not important. I'm a communication consultant, as Suzanne said. And um, our seminar today will start with a specific question, which is why a course on lobbying for scientists? Uh, today we will talk about lobbying activity, we will talk about advocacy, and we will talk about why these uh, activities are important for you as scientists and for you as this amazing center. Um, you you belong to. So we may say that uh, lobbying activity and representation or interest are important activities for scientists, for scientific institutions, and for everyone who is involved into the scientific research sector. Um, before starting um, talking about this point, I think that a proper definition of lobbying is mandatory in order to understand what we are talking on. So lobbying activity corresponds to the practice of groups of pressure, uh, which represent corporate interests within the institutions. And the aim, the final aim, is to influence political decisions and policy making procedures. This is for sure the, the, the EU, which is an important site where lobbyists work. Lobbyists try to balance the two competing tensions between the personal interest versus the collective interest. And in order to do so, they need uh, to build a communication process that can influence decision makers to put in place policy measures that primarily benefit the lobbying group and then, and then benefit, for sure, the, the common good. So, um, we can see that lobbyism is considered to be born in America in 1789. Uh, in Great Britain, we can, uh, for sure, uh, mention the Trade Union Act in 1855. It's important to understand that lobbyists are expert, are uh, someone who has technical knowledge and those technical knowledge can uh, use to influence the decision maker process. So interest groups can shape the decision makers proposal, providing them technical knowledge on what policies will lead towards the desired outcomes. Uh, why this? Policy makers know what they want to achieve. They know that they have to make some laws, they, they have to adopt some kind of uh, legislative body, but they, but they often don't have the required expertise on how to achieve the desired outcome. So uh, it's important for scientists to use an integrated communicative approach and to understand primarily what's lobbying, because thanks to the lobbying activity, scientists could contribute firstly to the dissemination of scientific knowledge and scientific values. And then uh, scientists can promote the adoption of best practices and law. Uh, lobbying activity will provide the scientific community with valuable and effective communicative tools and uh, this will enable them to facilitate and stimulate fundraising activity, which we all know is an important part of what you are doing, because it's important that 
research should be communicated properly in order to be understand and in order to achieve money uh, that are truly important. Um, know how to know what's lobbying activity is not enough maybe on this seminar but it's for sure definitely necessary uh, scientists can use an integrated communicative approach which allows them to manage their reputation both online and both offline and uh, an integrated communicative approach we may say that is useful because it gives values to the institution uh, to which scientists belong and uh, it's important because the management of reputation aims up the credibility and the recognition of the institutions and of the scientists individuals so it's important to understand the value of lobby or lobby uh, to understand the value of a good a sound good communication for scientists so what we are talking about on uh, this uh, seminar this seminar aims to offer useful tool and information for for you for scientists the first part of this course is dedicated to the lobbying activity just in order to understand um, concepts and the scenario the second part will explain how is possible for scientists to do indirect lobbying taking care of their reputation both online and uh, offline okay this is the the table of contents and now we are moving to the first part of this seminar. What, what is lobbying? Lobbying is the representation of corporate interests. And starting uh, uh, talking about lobbying, we may quote one of the most important uh, president and famous president of the United States, which was John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Kennedy said, talking about lobbyists, lobbies are those people who take 10 minutes and five sheets of paper to make me understand a problem. My collaborators for the same problem take three days and dozens of pages. So the quote is truly funny, okay? But it sums up well the reality of what is lobbying. Groups of interest or groups of pressure aim to gain a competitive advantage or to avoid a, uh, a competitive disadvantage. And this is truly related to the adoption or non-adoption of a legislative body by a decision maker. So we can say that uh, pressure groups carry out a sort of coordinated series of actions aim at informing public decision maker on a given issue and on your case about science about what to do about the researches you are doing in this amazing center so we can underline that uh, a groups or interest could exist only if the institutional system provides facilities for the participation of citizens to political process uh, the word lobby, uh, we all know, is often used by the media in a non-positive sense. Uh, it seems like that all problems that we have are made by lobbyists. So uh, this is not true for sure, but it's something that we are we have to understand in order to start with our we have a seminar. Uh, it's often preferred to use the synonym public affairs but we have to to say it properly lobbying activity is fundamental to the democratic life of a country and regarding this on slide 18 we see uh, an image coming from the past the occupy wall street uh, movement uh, was uh, a movement created by twitter the, the man said, I can't afford a lobbyist, I'm the 99% of people. That's not true. That's truly a mistake. Because lobby has effect on everyone. Even if you know it, there are lobbyists then, you know, try to envelop um, legislative body, try to change 
something about society. So that's the image of lobby by the media, even if it's not the correct one. We can talk about what is lobbying using five different perspectives and we can try to analyze this important phenomenon. So we can talk about the subject who influence actions, the nature of the phenomenon itself, the tools used for implementing purposes of the subject making lobby, the analysis of methods in which the group interests are regulated in a democratic regime, and the role that lobbying covers within contemporary societies. So everything starts by people, and so we have to start talking about pressure groups. Pressure groups, we can see that influence actions, decisions, or even policies of institutional representatives, as, for example, legislators, members or government agencies, regulatory bodies. A group can be qualified as a pressure group when recognize itself into the willingness to influence policymaker. So that's the first aim, the desire to influence policymaker. And this is what uh, pressure groups do. Okay, here we are. Uh, power and influence of pressure groups are related to the main position given uh, to the role they might assume in uh, legislative framework. And on this case, we can see a pretty different between the American scenario and the European scenario. Because in the European political framework, the public dimension of pressure group is totally marginal and in any case is less relevant if compared to the role given by party politics. Party policy, politics has the power to change and pressure groups try to convince, to influence the decision-making progress. In the American system, vice versa, a great importance is given to different forms of association. And this is truly related to the First Amendment of the US Constitution, uh, which said Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment, an establishment sorry, of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abriding the freedom of speech over the press, or, and this is the main important part for us, for, for, the, for, for this seminar, uh, the right of people peaceably to assemble and to petition to the government for a redress of grievances. So, we can see that the American system appears as the one where interest groups build a sense of belonging among people, making the members of the community aware about their participation in political business. And this is a peculiar difference between uh, our uh, legislative framework and the American legislative framework, because in reverse, vice versa, within the European system, including the Italian political context, lobbies are marginalized by political parties. Um, pressure groups started on these years to be viewed as new actors, as power structures of the state system. But we can see that in, Italian in, in, in Italy in particular, uh, political parties as power to understand, to evaluate, to adopt legislative, legislative body. Um, okay, so we can underline that uh, on this system, on the European system, lobbies are marginalized by political parties and pressure groups started to be viewed as new actors and power structures of the state system. Uh, when acts like a political actor. And we have to understand that it's not just a material way, but even NGOs, charity organizations can be categorized as interest groups if they act like political actor. So uh, even if we started talk, uh, uh, telling that 
lobby could be viewed in a bad bad uh, uh, idea in a bad reputation there is always space for a good lobby on slide 25 we can see three different way of seeing lobby the good lobby is a book written by a friend of mine alberto lemanno <clears throat> which tried to uh, specify that lobby is good ngo made lobbying activity um, charity organization do actively lobbying. On the other side, one article made by L'Espresso, which talk about the fact that the, the most important IT industry spend a lot of money in order to do in lobby in Brussels. And the, the, the first one captured states when EU governments have a channel for corporate interests. That's not lobbying. Lobby is positive, lobby is good, lobby is fundamental to the life of a democratic country. So we may say that doing lobby is one of the principal ways through which groups operate and interact. Interest encouraged might be ideal or might be concrete, might be material or might be for, for sure ideal. Uh, an example of pressure group could be the association promoting uh, political, religious and humanitarian purposes. So ONG, social cultural institutions are themselves groups of interest or groups of pressure and they do lobbying, interacting with decision makers. Promotional groups of interest regarding these do not exclusively act in order to lead benefits for their insiders. They can include uh, actors that play the role of enhancing advocacy function. And what is advocacy? Advocacy is the process. Here we are. Advocacy is the process of making a case which start from the perceived violation of standard of right, fairness and civility. So we may say that, uh, um, okay, NGOs, social movements, volunteer bodies belong to the lobby no profit category with the aim of acting in the name of public interest or in the name of the community. Uh, in spite of preconceptions, lobbies intervenes where the collectivity cannot. Acting in its place as the active interlocutor who brings issues and problems which stands outside the political agenda to the attention of the institution. So, uh, lobbies, lo lobbying activity is truly fundamental for the democratic life of a country because pressure groups, thanks to the activity of influencing decision maker, can change societies, could promote a different approach to a lot of problems that we all every day um, facing. For example, uh, on slide 29, Amnesty International is one of the greatest NGOs that do a lot of lobbying activity. So, uh, in these modern terms, lobbying activity through decision-making bodies is not just comparable to a simple promotion of interest. It is a structural element for the need of participation inside a democratic system. Lobbyists in this uh, scenario can be a skillful mediator able to enter into the legislative process trying to edit the content if retained inappropriate in relation to the interest that he or she represents. And this is important because in order to understand what is lobbying, it's important the political framework where subjects representing interest, because uh, those political systems can be considered as democratic ones for the area of freedom left to social groups, which are intermediate between the state and individuals. So we may start talking uh, in, in depth about uh, what is lobbying, uh, touching five different strategies of lobbying. 
in defining lobbying as the set of strategies put, uh, put in place by the groups within the institutional context for coming into contact with public decision makers, we can underline five different types of lobbying activity, which are the direct lobbying, the grassroots lobbying, the coalitions, party funding, integrated communication and reputation management. So uh, it's important to underline that um, the first four methods should be done only by lobbyist professional. It's not easy for someone who is not involved into the legislative process to understand how to act. It's something that should be done only by specialized society that know how to do and know how to do properly. But we can understand that scientists or people could use the last one, an integrated communication and reputation approach in order to manage their reputation and the reputation of the institute they are working for. So it's true that lobbies for lobbies, but even people that are not lobbyist professionals can do a kind of un indirect lobbying. So starting from the, the, first, uh, the first type of lobbying, direct lobbying is the most traditional for sure, is uh, represented by any kind of attempt to influence new or even existing legislation communicating with a representative of a legislative body. It's maybe the, the, simple way, the, the, the simplest way to inform a public, a public the, the seeder and corresponds to the most traditional form of lobbyism uh, concerning the report of the necessary expertise to make the institution aware of the purposes or requests of, of a group. The second one is the grassroots lobbying, uh, a form of influence similar to campaigning, which operates as a pure form of persuasion by asking the general audience to contact the legislator or mobilize public around a legislative issue. So, for example, um, the aim is to influence the public opinion or part of the public opinion to the, necess the, 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 the necessity of uh, social changing. And for example, I, I, in slide 33, we can see the Black Lives Matter movement, which, has, which is an important movement that is trying to change something, especially in the American scenario. And if we have to talk about the Italian framework, we can mention the story of Marco Pannella, which was one of the most important politicians and one of the most important experts in grassroots lobbying. The third type of lobbying is the coalition lobbying, which is a kind of peculiar technique because it consists in the chance of associate multiple interests and organize structures of them through the representation of various groups. So we can underline that this peculiar technique can be used properly on environmental and health matters because of uh, the common areas of application of coalition lobby, because it is important to connect the actors in order to achieve more strength, in order to act in, in a coordinated way with decision makers. Last but not least, we can see with the party funding, which is maybe mm, the worst type of lobbying and uh, is a technical lobbying which possesses a range of tools, mechanisms, initiatives and processes that introduce the chance of influencing public policies with the use of financial contributions. And uh, I, uh, I related this type of lobby to the former president, Donald Trump, because yeah, uh, he used this kind of lobby a lot in order to do his political activity. So uh, the aim of this seminar is not to explain in details 
every possible methods of influence that a pressure group may use in order to persuade decision makers. Lobbying remains a very technical job. And as I already said, uh, lobbying is for lobbyists. Lobby must be done by uh, specialized companies and must be delegated to professionals. And the scheme, um, the, 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 the scheme presented in slide uh, 38 uh, could try to underline the uh, complex scenario on which lobbies work every day. So it's not easy how to, to understand how to act. It's not easy to understand who is our listeners, who is the politician we are going to talk with uh, in order to change something. But we can see that uh, having defined that the work of lobbies cannot be done without the assistance of a specialized firm, it's important to define what research centers and individual researchers can do on their own because no scientist can afford to go it alone doing lobby. And in addition, this collaboration is mandatory for create a specific development to the scientific uh, community. Scientists should manage their reputation. And in doing so, they can help to spread a scientific mindset upon decision makers. So integrated communication is a different way to lobby and is something that you can do properly. Uh, doing your, your daily work is not important to, to do something which is strange, something which is outside what you do daily. You have to think that communication of what you do is important and, is, uh, and, and should be done properly using the right methods. Um, we may say that using an integrated approach to communication is important because it's a different way to lobbying and complex organization using this integrated communicative approach can do lobby as well. Because the way you tell and promote your discoveries, you're being a person at the service of science, you're belonging to this amazing community. All of these contribute to affect the reputation of this center and for sure of the scientific research in, um, in complex. So this is moving us to the second part of this seminar, which is truly dedicated to the communication of science. Uh, researches depend for their founding on the choices of politicians. We all know this. Maybe, maybe it's not uh, underlined as well, but it's important to say it. And depends even uh, on the choices of ordinary people, because ordinary people should have the instrument, the right tools in order to understand what you do during your day what the research you are going on and why is important. So often the scientific community try to restore the trust in opposite to the danger represented by the idea uh, that any opinion can have the same weight. Uncertainty about sources and uncertainty about information is the key of our time. Uh, we live in an era of total disinformation, and in this era, science must be told, must be uh, promoted, and tell properly. Communicate science is an important tool that scientists should use properly. Uh, it is important to say that uh, we can't just say we believe in science, because science is not a belief. Science is a rational knowledge. And so we have to be ambassador of a scientific um, approach to life, of a scientific way to tell stories, to promote what we do in societies and within the societies. Uh, people are overloaded by information. We often don't know how to use it. We often don't know uh, if an information is true, if not, we 
can't understand the complex scenario of our times because people live in so-called echo chamber small and abstract areas in which they can find like-minded people okay this is a funny example of an echo chamber and uh, we may say that uh, people don't have tools in order to figure out if an information is true or not they don't have the scientific background in order to fully understand a complex scenario or a data so uh, we all have to um, speak speak about science properly and scientific fundamentalism and echo chambers influence public debate on particular issues and all science related communications so scientists should not fall into the idea of scientific fundamentalism because this mood of viewing science do not allow the formation of an informed public opinion it's important for, for all of us to contribute to the dissemination of scientific values. And in order to do so, we don't have to fall into the scientific fundamentalism. Science is a journey. Science is a way to solve problems, trying to use the scientific methods. Science so, uh, must promote culture, must simulate a scientific sensibility to opinion leaders, to decision makers, to civil society. Telling science we have to stimulate curiosity, offering to listeners a method of reasoning. The traditional method called the deficit model no longer has any practical uh, validity because science is not a simple transferring of knowledge from, from those who know to these who do not that's not true anymore maybe in the past but nowadays that's not true it's important for those working in science to build bridges and to create connections with society. And in this aim, we can underline the importance of the so-called third mission, which connects the world of research with the world of business, with institutional decision makers and opinion leaders. Citizens should always have the tools in order to understand what we are talking to them. They have to understand what research can do for the envelope of their life. Dissemination of science should allow everyone the tools to form rational thinking and a scientific culture for everyone. There's no discrimination in science, and this is important. There are several methods in order to uh, communicate science. A scientific article, for example, is something which I think that is, is a part of your job, shares the news that are not understood yet. Scientific articles has the aim not to inform about fact, but try to underline the evolution of science. And this is important. But for a sound good communication of science, there's an important and crucial aspect, which is blindness. Journalism, storytelling, scientific research need people who can tell and write about science properly. Writing and telling in simple manners promote the acquisition of information contribute to the dissemination of scientific values and scientific uh, criteria among people. And this is the, the main mission that you as scientists should have to promote scientific idea. Uh, first of all, in order to adopt a sound good communication for science, you need to be simple. And this rule is written into one of my favorite, favorite book ever, which is The American Lesson, written by the famous writer and essayist Italo Calvino. Italo Calvino hypothesized six proposals for the communicators of the next millennium, which are lightness, rapidity, exactitude, 
visibility, multiplicity, and consistency. For Italo Calvino, lightness is escaping the dense network of public and private constraints, which end up dropping every existence in every time and notes. Lightness is an approach that science storytellers must take always, because only a lightly written text leaves the reader with the energy, with the attention, with the right tension necessary to become familiar with the scientific content. And so we can see that everyone communicates science, everyone. A story, a lecture, an essay, uh, everything could be useful in order to promote to opinion leaders, to decision makers, to civil society, a um, uh, scientific way to understand problems, a scientific approach to what is uh, the problem solving uh, tools. On this point, we have to talk about the concept of frame, which is really important. And the frame is the track along which the discourse moves, public or private, as the case may be. Frame is uh, the scenario on which a given discourse is established. Uh, as it is reported by George Lakoff in his famous book, Don't Think of an Elephant, impose a frame, an idea on public opinion or listeners is not difficult at all. Because if I say to you, don't think on an, of an elephant, what's the first thing you're going to think about? The elephant. And this is important for scientists because telling about science is an exercise that requires to use words that suit the author, the topic and the intended audience. Every aspect of science could be told if we choose the right words, if we choose the right listeners, if we choose to speak in a simple way. On, uh, on his book, The Design of Everyday Things, Donald Norman highlights the gap between the functioning of human mind and most of the objects that everyday life asks us to use. A poor design of many everyday objects leads to people not to really understand how to use them. <laughs> and, and I think that everyone could have at least one example of the, on, on their life about this. Regarding the communication science, this book seems to underline how trust or mistrust in science may depend in a poorly adoptive and effective way to tell science, to communicate science. And this is important for us because if we want to share a scientific mindset upon civil society, we have to understand that maybe you are scientists, so you have scientific criteria and scientific know-how, but public opinions don't have your background of study of scientific achievement. It is important to improve a lot in the design of science because political class, opinion leaders, consumers, public opinion and civil society pay little attention to what scientists say, really little attention. They listen for a short time and they often don't have the right grammar useful to understand a concept as complex as science. So we have to understand who, who are talking on. Um, in the next few slides, I'll try to give you some tips on how to capture listeners' attention. I'll give you, I'll try to give you some pieces of advice on how to communicate science properly. Uh, speaking about, uh, for example, numbers, estimates, percent per percentage, graphs, diagrams, signs, symbols, metaphors, similes, and images. Uh, there are a lot of elements that, uh, when used properly, help to keep listeners' attention. And it's important to start 
talking about grammar because grammar is fundamental if we want to talk properly about science. Numbers especially have fundamental elements in the grammar for scientists and researchers. We all know we all use numbers to, to speak about our job, so they are truly important. Numbers are tools for understanding facts. They allow us to better understand what we are saying, but to achieve this goal, we need to be good at using numbers in the right way. Because numbers, if used without providing to listeners with the methodologies to understand them, risk inhibiting all possible reasoning, leading those who are to accept them as they are. But if you do so, if you, if you don't try to make the listener understand you, you're not communicating science. You're not communicating properly. Numbers should always be centered, contextualized and told to educate listeners to understand their meaning. Numbers should be used to better argue the facts that are happening. Um, as scientist uh, Benedict Ross and Joe Harris said, everyone must have the opportunity to try to comment and play with numbers, which are important for communication of science. It's important when we use numbers to give an order of magnitude between measures. Using numbers without explaining why you choose to use them is not an effective communication choice. And using number in the communication of science is never a zero-sum game. It's always something that changes the perspectives of people who listen to us. We have to think that it's important not to fall into the game of numbers. Practice levity, choosing which data is to include and which is not, because too much information may divert attention from other more important elements of our message. As always, less is more. Always. This is important for every kind of communication. Those who communicate science must be frugal. Even, for example, when it's time to use a mathematical formula, we must not run the risk of considering formulas necessary to maintain the scientific rigor of our arguments. Because formula is a concentration of symbols, each of which has an exact and precise definition. So if there's enough space in order to explain the formula, there's no point on introducing it into the argument. It's not useful at all. It's important to understand that it's not possible to communicate science by having the ideal rigor and effectiveness. Because this is written in, uh, in these amazing formulas formulated by Pietro Greco and written in his article, What Type of Science Communication Best Suits Emerging Countries? Um, it is not possible to communicate science by having the ideal rigor and effectiveness, because as the one increases, the second decreases. So we have to speak easier. We have to fully understand that it's important to be connected with our listeners. Maybe in another time with another we, we were scientists we can talk about formulas numbers data because we have a common background but if we talk with decision makers when we talk with opinion leaders we have to, to understand that maybe it's better to speak easy to try to um to 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 choose a communication which is more effective than you know precise uh, those who communicate science never do so unambiguously because every single word even the most clear has areas of overlap common to different interlocutors 
It's important to find a right balance between the reasons of those who listen to us and the scientific rigor of communicate science properly. And uh, this is an amazing phrase made by Tito Tognetti. Uh, the very possibility of communication stays on ambiguity, which in a sense represents its structural stability. This is a peculiar phrase for every communication. Going on on the elements of grammar for the communication of science, graphs, diagrams, signs and symbols are sure important too for the communication of science. Graphs are an evolution of quantitative data and they are a useful guide to listener in reasoning. Telling science, we use a lot of symbols, for sure, signs and diagrams. They, uh, all, all these elements have to be used sparingly. We have to find a correct balance between rigor and, and effectiveness, because our aim is to be understood, is not to tell science using all our elements. There's another space for this kind of communication. When we talk with politicians, we have to believe that politicians has no, have no scientific background. So we have to speak simple. Going on again, hypotheses, models and simulation are also proper elements of the narrative of scientists and research centers. Science can speak only using assumptions, which are reasonable and meaningful. And it's important to say that simulation is a tool, really is a really useful tool for understanding and predicting reality. So it's important to understand that user model represent a broad category of the phenomena. Models, as well as theory, observation and experiments are conceptual tools of research. Uh, Concreteness is, is another way to tell the public maker about science, stimulating their interest. Together with physicality and tangibility, these are characteristics that should not be missing in the storytelling of science. And uh, maybe the most effective way to tell about science is using images. Images are, are very powerful tools, but they risk sometimes to put words in shadows. Images can simplify an explanation of a certain technical aspect. Imagine will be imprinted in the memory of the listener. Images, use of rhetorical figures, and the use of stories stick in the mind of opinion leaders and decision makers and allow scientific research to progress. Using, using examples for, uh, are useful for showing the concrete aspect of science. Exemplify permit to the listeners to understand what we want to say. Communicate science with images is important because images will be remembered for a long time. And this is our aim. The aim is to speak with someone and to be remembered to those Anecdotes are also important, sorry, here we are. Anecdotes are also important in helping listeners to understand science because anecdotes serve to create a bridge between multiple concepts, helping to tie together parts of the argument that are likely to remain distinct. And metaphors, for sure, allow us to generate an image in the mind of listener. Um, regarding this, we may say that metaphor allows, uh, allows us to generate an image in the mind of the listener, creates worldviews that allows us to better understand what we are telling. It is a powerful way of looking at the facts we are telling and it shapes the narrative of science. Metaphor is an implicit analogy compares two terms that are over the instant. 
Now, before talking about this, I want to show you this amazing ID made by Google. Vorreste pensare che io sia in vacanza, invece sto lavorando. E proprio questo è il posto dove mi vengono le idee migliori. Sto amministrando il mio centro clienti Google AdWords. Io e i miei fratelli abbiamo un'azienda sul web che commercializza cartucce e inchiosti per stampanti. È la nostra vita. Andiamo! Il progetto web è organico, e va curato e seguito nel tempo. Google AdWords ci ha guidato nel far crescere la nostra impresa ed è una risorsa insostituibile. Alfredo, Alessandro e Andrea sono tre gemelli. Da piccoli erano molto creativi. Nei mercatini rivendevano di tutto e di più. Tipo prendevano delle cose inutili a casa e cercavano di venderli. E siccome non erano calmi, stavano sempre in movimento, hanno distrutto persino casa, l'intomaco. Ricordo ancora le parole di mio fratello Alfredo quando ero a Londra. Sto costruendo un sito web per vendere cartucce e inchiostri online. E io ho detto, bene, prepara la macchina, arriviamo e partiamo. Dal momento in cui siamo nati non avevamo una grossa visibilità e quindi non avevamo neanche un grosso parco clienti. Google ci ha permesso di avere questo parco clienti. Mi sono subito reso conto che era una potenza perché noi riuscivamo, grazie ad AdWords, a fare clienti in tutta Italia seduti di fronte alla, alla nostra solita vista. È una figata perché è un mezzo molto flessibile e allo stesso tempo molto potente eh, anche per una piccola impresa, soprattutto per una piccola impresa ed è un mezzo molto veloce, lo capisci subito, capisci subito le risposte che ci sono dal mercato. È come se prima avessimo un negozio in una campagna sperduta e Google avesse permesso invece in un istante di trasferirci al centro di una grossa città nel mezzo delle vie commerciali. E basta un semplice clic, vedere anche quali sono le parole chiave che hanno portato più risultati o meno, cambiarle. Io consiglio a tanti piccoli imprenditori e imprese italiane di entrare in AdWords per tante ragioni. Prima perché il costo è molto basso. Poi uno può decidere qualsiasi tipo di spesa. Uno inizia, spende poco, poi si rende conto di come funziona, quindi va avanti. Grazie Google! Ok, let's move back to our presentation. Ok, so... Uh, we may say that speaking using metaphors permit to use stories for capturing the attention of those who are listening to us. Stories are crucial in the communication of science, as we, we noticed with the Google Ads, because story responds to the principle people don't like companies, people like people. Stories allow us to get difficult concepts across by explaining them in a simple way. And that's what science, the, the, the communication of science should do. Reporting to this point, no, uh, sorry, uh, stories are important because they bypass the so-called cognitive saving. Human brain tends to reason as little as possible in order to conserve energy. When we interact with a person, we only partially listen to what is being said to us. And this is a tension, the, the threshold is lower the less time we have available and the higher our propensity not to listen. So, telling a story is the only way to point across. The story is like a fairy tale, Allow, uh, allow you to be remembered. And to communicate science effectively is important to ask, what's in it for me? I think that everyone of you has seen this, this picture. What does my interlocutor want to hear? What does she or he really care about? Attention is earned, it must be worn. Story shifts the focus from abstract to concrete. Story makes the abstract easy to understand and it allows the listener to take a position on issues they don't know in depth. 
scientific data and science is the primary background for science storytelling, but it's also necessary to capture the attention of decision makers and opinion leaders. And for doing so, you have to speak using stories. Emotional involvement is a branch of persuasion. It aims to open the listeners to perceiving feelings and experiencing emotions they do not have the basis to fully understand. To stimulate mobilization and promote a scientific culture is necessary to speak in a concrete way. It is necessary to show, don't tell. Metaphors and stories allows to communicate science properly. Those involving science can use metaphorical language to talk with stakeholders, public opinion and decision makers, and to adopt a scientific communication style to talk about science. Metaphors emphasizes elements of a concept and conceals other. And we may say that uh, a concrete example in the use of metaphors can be found in the political communication. Margaret Thatcher, a former English Prime Minister, on this picture she was showing the effect of inflection. So, on one day you can buy uh, a different amount of stuff. An image could speak more than several words, and this was one of the image that helped her in order to, to win the general election. Another example, Donald Reagan shows the show Americans all the benefit of the so-called space shield. He had the idea to use an important metaphor of the shield in order to assure consensus on the idea of an anti-ballistic system. But if uh, he used the word anti-ballistic system, space shield, more secure, more important, more comfortable for everyone. So last but not least, what an important center like yours can do in order to communicate science using an integrated communicative approach. Events, meetings, seminars, roundtables are opportunities that research centers can use to promote a constructive and valuable dialogue with institutions. It is good to build an outgoing relationship with guests out there because they have they should have a prominent interest in the topic involving decision makers civil society and opinion leaders in events is an activity called stakeholder engagement value transparency concreteness and effectiveness are the characteristics of a communication for science that aim to create synergy synergy with companies, synergy with politicians, synergies with civil society, with opinion leaders. Fundamental to stakeholder engagement is the stakeholder mapping. Understand who are our listeners, who are our interlocutors. It's fundamental in order to communicate properly. And we have to say that effective and concrete communication is essential at these events. With journalists, politicians and opinion leaders, we might say that a story is worth than thousand words. Thank you. <laughs>